Hello everyone. This is part three of our paving series. I'm Burr Stewart and this is the HO scale Burlington Northern. I'll flip the uh, camera around. We can see the model railroad layout and we'll be talking about all kinds of things. But today I want to continue paving the inner bay car shops area that we started a little earlier this week or this month, last month, something. Anyway, these are the car shops. And I happen to have a bunch of Woodland Scenics gray fine ballast. So I thought, well, I'll try using this for the gravel section that's um, outside the asphalt section. So see here, this is the asphalt part of the paving near the car shop. And if you if we go on the other end, I'll just do a little orientation here. We do a, go on the other end, we have uh, the same situation here, asphalt, and then the um, gravel. Now, I don't think this is the best way to make gravel, but it, it is a way to do it. So that's what I did. And you can see that on some of my other videos. See, this is a, a bit of an uneven edge here, which uh, might be all right. We'll get to that later. What we're going to do today is finish the right edge, um, which can be bigger than this. Now, in the, as I showed you before, in the prototype, it's a very, the prototype has a very long paved area on both sides of the car shop. And of course, on a model railroad, you have to make uh, selective compression. Th this section right, this here, you, you can see the edge of the asphalt pavement, and then you can see they have some gravel. And the other interesting thing about this is they keep the space um, um, where the points turn on the turnouts, they keep that uncovered with gravel. So I modeled that over here. I left the points open because I saw in the photograph that's what the prototype did. They just drove around that if they were driving a, a vehicle. So we're going to do the same thing today. And I don't have too far to go. Um, but I thought I would just show you that since the last uh, uh, video I did on this, the live stream, uh, I learned a couple of things the hard way. Um, with, uh, about how to apply the glue. So we'll start out here with um, we'll start out with the ballast. And I one of the things I learned from the last time is it really is worth finding a paper cup and using a paper cup Oh, you can't see what I'm doing. I'm pouring the ballast into the paper cup so that I have I have some ballast to work with in this cup. But the big advantage of this is that you can point the cup sharply down and then you have more precise control over where you put the ballast. And what I'm gonna be doing here is, uh, let's start with the back so that we won't mess it up. And, and of course, the other question is how far to extend this and I'm having a lot of trouble deciding, but I think I want to extend it. My hand is shaking this morning. Um, I want to extend it out about to where the, the, the points are. And I think that'll be fine. Now see, we're un, uh, unlike usual, Normally when you're ballasting, you're putting the ballast um, you know, in between the ties and the rail sticks up. But here, we're trying to um, cover all the area so that the trucks can drive over this whole paved area. So it's a little tricky to figure out 
exactly how much ballast to apply here, but we'll do the best we can. I uh, don't like how much my hand is shaking, but on the other hand, I suppose it shows you that it's not that precise a process. Now, of course, the most difficult part of all this is to keep the the switch points clear and open and the, the point turnout, the mechanism working. So you see how I, I have a little more control here, at least if my hand wasn't shaking, I'd have more control. And in a minute, we'll take the steel rule and we'll level it all out and see what, what we've got and whether we need more ballast. Um, we have not enough. This is going all right. The, the, this, tr this track off to the back here is the caboose track. So um, I figured we'd pave up to the edge of the rail and then uh, personnel could get off their, uh, their pickup trucks or whatever and step onto the uh, the stirrup, the, uh, the steps on the caboose. All right, I don't, I don't really know exactly how much I needed here, but now I take my steel rule, and this is similar to what we did before. Uh, we just leveled it off. Um, it looks like we're going to need more because this is not covering. It's a little hard to see how it sort of pulls it up. That's all very nice, but clearly we need more. This method of leveling it with a ruler does create a pretty nice surface, which you can see here. It's a pretty smooth surface. Now, I had a comment in the in the YouTube uh, group um, channel. I had someone comment that they they really liked uh, the way it turned out, and I really appreciate that. But I, I want to say that I think modeling loose gravel roads is a very difficult thing to do in, in this small of a scale. Because in the prototype, the gravel surface is not you know, regularly smoothed out. So you know, trucks drive over it. And um, I, I think there should be more variation than we have here, but I, I'm not sure the best way to achieve it. So for now, we're just we're letting it go. Now, another thing that occurred to me after I started doing this is that it might make sense to check one more time all the wiring of the rails and make sure that the rails don't need any remedial uh, soldering of feeders or anything like that. But I forgot about all that in my excitement to get this live stream started. So we end up with an electrical problem down the road. I'll just, I'll have to um, wet the whole thing, take up some ballast and do it, fix it. I've had really good luck with this. Um, the Shinohara turnouts. And, well, we're getting close. We're getting close. I don't want to take too much time on this, but I want to get it at least good enough that we don't regret it later. There's an article in the uh, this month's Model Railroader magazine that just came out, talking about how to use the new Walther's turn, how to replace the old um, Shinohara turnouts with the new Walther's turnouts. And I'm here to say that these turnouts, like the one we're looking at right now, I installed in the late 80s. 
And more recently, I put frog juicers on them so that the point, so that I wasn't dependent on the point contact for the uh, electrical power of the rails. And ever since I put the frog juicers in, I haven't really had any issues with these old turnouts. So if I start to really have problems, I guess I can take this all apart and upgrade it, but for the moment, I'm just gonna stick with what we have here. I think it's kind of amazing when I, you know, how long ago 1987 was or whenever it was that I put these turnouts in. Maybe it was 93, but it was a long time ago. And it's still, it's still working great. I'm really looking forward to getting this pavement done and getting this part of the layout back because I've never, I've never been really happy with the operational aspects of this car repair area. And now I can start to put, make some way bills for cars that need to be um, repaired or stick little inserts in the car card pockets that say, take this car, you know, to the car repair shop and that'll be a whole switching move that previously we didn't have. Now you can see moving this stuff around, that's a little tricky, but not bad. See, it just smooths right out. Let's try this part now. Yeah, this is, this is looking real good too. Whoops. You got to be careful not to fall off the rail. Oh, this is looking real nice now. Of course, what's deceptive, as you know from my last video, is after you have it smooth and you like it, you have to get rid of the rails that are in the um, flangeways. That takes a little time. That's kind of annoying. Now, over in this section here, I plan to probably extend the road um, here so that that people can drive along the side of the yard. So I might bevel this down to a road height. I'm not going to use this same gravel for the road. I just want a, a gradual feather down here. If feather is the right word, I think it is. And that looks great. See, that's pretty easy to do. And the same over here. I don't really want a sharp edge. I want to let a truck drive up and over that, you know, get on the pavement surface. Now, I'm, that looks a little uneven, but other, otherwise, if you can see from the camera, there, there's a little bit of unevenness in that corner over here. But, you know, I'm, I'm thinking we don't really want the entire thing to be too uniformly flat, um, especially near the edges like this, because trucks would be driving up and down from um, whatever area there is. Yeah, see, that's good. That's a nice bevel. Um, I am wondering if we're almost ready for the the flangeway part. I think we need a little bit more here. A little bit more here. But we definitely don't want to uh, cover up the ground throw. Of course, the prototype would have a much smaller <laughs> ground throw to deal with. Uh, that needs a little more in there in that hole despite what I just said. I don't mean to babble, but I, I can't imagine watching someone apply ballast is the most fascinating thing in the world, even if their babble isn't either. Okay. Now, I'm gonna have to give up and move that Chevy somewhere else. All right.
Now, one thing to remember when you're doing this is that uh, you can always go back later and uh, put in a little patch. So I don't have to get too obsessed with it. Well, all right. Um, what do we think about that? Is it good enough? I'd say so. There are five of you watching now. I appreciate it. I hope you have fun doing your own paving someday. I just took off my shirt because it's getting warm down here. You know, this would be a nice time for me to take a break and show you the lighting setup that I have. It's always nice to break things up a little bit. So these are two LED flat panel lights. There's one on the right-hand side and one on the left-hand side. These are pretty cool things. They You can adjust the color temperature of the light and the intensity. I think I have them both turned set to 3600 Kelvin and 100% brightness, just for your benefit, basically. Um, but I, you know, I, I suppose I shouldn't say that. It helps me, too, to have it as well lit as possible. Um, okay, so having said that, gives me a moment to breathe. What else do we need to fix here? Oh, the flangeways. I know, I wanted to take my plier. This is the most useful tool I have in my whole my whole railroad is these little angled pliers. I'm constantly using them for different things. Um, in this case, I'm just going to use them to brush some of the gravel away from the throw rod. Managing throw rods and turnout linkages has got to be one of the most challenging parts of any model railroad. I'm lucky that this one is working fine so far, but I do want to keep the gravel off the the throw rod if I ever have a problem in the future. Now the main thing I want to check here is make sure I'm not binding the I'm not gluing down some ballast that would bind the the throw mechanism. And I think I think I've achieved that. But I'm a little nervous about it. And of course, I'd also really like it if I covered the bottom there with a little bit of gravel. But again, that's something we can fix later. And there's also a little bit of gravel in there we could get rid of. Uh, all right, now, I don't like this. Right up here near the edge, it looks like we have an area that's dipped down. And there's one solution to that, which is just to put a little more in and take our ruler and level it off. Now you notice I have my blue tape dam here. Oh gosh, that's interesting. When I did this, it, it pushed the uh, pavement out farther, indicating that I probably had not pushed down on that dam far enough. This, this is really a question of taste, how much you want to... See, what happened was when I pushed this ballast down with my finger, it, it raised it up in elevation to the left of my finger while it was putting it down on the right. So um, then when I came back with the ruler, it, it uh, didn't turn out the same way. This sort of silliness here, because like I said, I'll, I'll put in a road surface. They're using some real rock material instead of this. All right, now the flangeway problem. I'm going to keep this gravel away from this mechanism. I don't think I demonstrated on the last live stream. I didn't demonstrate oiling, or maybe I did, putting oil on the mechanism here, but I'm not going to do it until we're gluing because I don't want to mess up the 
procedure. All right, so what are we saying about this now? Are we saying that that's better? Yeah, that's better. We're saying flange ways. Come on, Burr. Flange ways. Well, and what I'm going to show you in a minute is how if you use eyedroppers, you have way more control than, than what I was doing before with the spray bottle. Way better. So if I take this, you're not supposed to do this with a standard gauge, but I'm doing it anyway. Um, I'm going to take this and just run it along the track in order to start clearing out the flange way. And then I'll just come back with something else, and a little screwdriver, and clear out the flange ways more. Fortunately, for our purposes this morning or this afternoon, depending on where you live, um, we only have these two tracks to worry about. So the flange way hassle won't take as long as it might. Now, another way you could do this is to put a little wire or piece of styrene or something like that. You could put that on the edge and then pull it up. But of course, well, you could. I've, I've, I've done that myself and I've seen other people do it. It's clever. I just didn't uh, have that much patience or something. Organization. Okay, so that was the first step. And now I'm going to take a little barbecue skewer with a point on it and run it along here. Oops. I'm going to run it along here just to try to clear out a bigger hole. Now this is an example of um, well, what would you call it? Preventive, uh, what's the right buzzword for this? What I'm trying to say is that it's, it's annoying right now because I'd like to be gluing already, but I'm spending time getting these little grains out. But what I want to say is that if you get it out now while they're, while they're dry, it's about 10 times easier than to do it either when they're wet or after the glue has dried. And particularly bad is trying to make modifications when the glue is when it's wet. Because what happens is you inevitably gum up, you ruin your surface. And that's kind of what happened over on the left side when we were doing that in the last live stream. Now, I never find these frog areas particularly satisfactory with this gravel paving, but I'll just do the best we can. We'll just do the best we can, right? What else can you do? So here's this. And as I've said before, what I tend to do is get the glue down, go away for six hours, come back when it's starting to be dry, but not fully dry. And I do this whole thing I'm doing right now again, so that I have a, a shot at getting the ballast grains off the rail before it's really hard to do it, which is when it's completely dried. The other thing I think I'm finding with this paved street is if is it's not as critical to get the grains off the rail because you can't even see the rail anyway. And the flange ways of our RP25 wheel sets are really not that deep. I can't remember off the top of my head how deep they are, but I want to say if it's RP25, maybe it's 25 hundredths of an inch. But that flange way is, is pretty narrow. Now, this is always a little dicey. If I want to get those grains off the 
top of the rail there. I don't know how much of this you can see the detail that I have. Okay. Uh, now, I think we just decided that was that we got the flangeways clear. I think that's what we just decided. Now that, and, and of course, I only have to clear it where the flanges will go and not on the other parts, which should be right up against the rail for this kind of pavement. And we did agree that we're going to feather this down a little bit so that the trucks can easily drive up onto the gravel surface. Okay, I'm looking around. I'm not seeing any further problems with this. So let's move right into gluing. Um, now, like I said, I learned a lot since last week about how bad it is. Let me just uh, show you that so we break this thing up a little. Last week, I think it was, we were gluing this part here, the same method, the same gravel, but I used a spray bottle to put the wetting alcohol on and then another uh, large uh, bottle to apply the glue. And as you remember, I went oops several times. Well, here's an example right here, of one of my oopses, where uh, you know, I just screwed it up. I mean, because I it was such a blunt instrument. Now, what we're going to do today is a little more boring, but much more precise, which is to use a eyedropper. Now, it, when we're done, I may come over here and, and uh, fill that pothole. Now, another thing you might notice, I don't know if you can really see it, but the, the surface is uh, somewhat splotched in different colors, and that's because my friends were over here on Tuesday with uh, and suggested we use pan pastels. And so uh, we used a, a, a neutral gray and some kind of a brown to, to create this sort of in the look of the gravel. And that really makes it look better than just this uniform color. Now, one of them was suggesting that we use a a mixture of grays to bring out the texture. Here's an example right here. There, uh, Woodland Scenics has a thing called a gray blend, uh, B1393, and you can see if we use this gray blend, there'd be some salt and pepper speckling. I, I tried, uh, I tried this um, because ballast, you know, gravel can be multicolored, but I thought the salt and pepper looked much more like railroad ballast than not like a gravel road. So I stuck with the uniform gray, and then we come back later and apply some uh, pan pastels. And maybe I'll do an oil wash, too. And we'll, one, of, one of the uh, YouTube channel viewers suggested that I put some uh, oil spots on the road after we get it done. All right. So... The gluing. Now I've got some used alcohol here because uh, one of my friends brought over an ultrasonic cleaner for the airbrush and the, we cleaned it and the alcohol. And instead of throwing away the out, see it's got a little bit of a tint to it because of the paint from the um, spray, but uh, the airbrush. But I thought, well, we don't care in the pavement if there's a little tint to the wetting agent. So I'm just I'm just pouring this into a jar so it'll be easy easier to use with a with an eyedropper. Can you see that? I've got to make sure I got a good angle on this thing. Is that a little better. So here's the alcohol, and here's a jar we can put the glue in. You might remember this bottle I was using before for putting down the glue. I'll shake it a little bit. This is diluted at least one to one. I think it might be slightly more than one part water to one part um, Elmer's glue. I'll just pour some of this in for us to use here. I'm not sure how much we'll need, but we can always put it back. See this, this uh, sign says two to one water to Elmer's glue, but I, I'm not sure that I think it's more like one to one because I've been messing around with my different bottles of glue. So now I've got two 
eyedroppers today. Unlike the total mess that we had last time, we're going to do something a little more precise here. Take some alcohol. Let's start in the back. And I, I'm just checking to make sure you can see. Yeah, you can see it fine. So I'm going to drop this alcohol right on this surface that we've decided we like. I'm just going to drop it on there. And you will be amazed after this all dries that you won't be able to see the seam uh, at all. Although I could make an argument that using alcohol with stain in it might cause a problem, but I seriously don't think there's enough stain in there to make any difference to anything. But I do recommend using an ultrasonic cleaner to clean the tip of your airbrush because I've been using this one airbrush for, I don't know, 20 years, and I had never read the manual on how you're supposed to really seriously clean an airbrush after you use it. So my friend Tim Taylor was over here on Tuesday, and he took me to school on that. And like I said, as a result, we have some tinted alcohol. But I'm not going to buy an ultrasonic cleaner because I can always get him to come over. And let's hear it for sharing tools when possible. Not to mention having friends. That's a good thing when you're trying to build a railroad. Now, I know this is incredibly tedious, but it, in a minute, I'll be, I'll be putting glue on this little patch. And you'll see how much better the control is than what I was doing last week. I mean, seriously, don't ever do what I did last week. That was a real mistake. You know, I was just spraying alcohol. And of course, as soon as the... I mean, maybe it's possible to get a very, very precise sprayer. Uh, we talked about whether you could use an airbrush. Um, and spray alcohol with an airbrush and get a fine enough mist that it wouldn't disturb the particles? I mean, I guess we could do that. But see how long this takes? And one drop at a time, I'm going to be lucky to just get this one panel done. Let's see here. Now, the, another question which I don't, I don't know the answer to is, what is the right amount of time to let the alcohol wetting solution stay before you need to uh, do it again? So here's the Elmer's glue. And we just stick this on here. And see how it's not disturbing? It's not disturbing any of my, my grains. It's not moving anything. It's kind of amazing. What, what was happening last week was that I was using that huge bottle. And it would dribble out in uncontrolled ways that would cause rivers to form. I don't like the way that this only takes a little bit of glue and then runs out. Yeah, I don't know how to, I mean, I guess there's probably probably a way to speed this up. Did you see how that one drop just came from a farther height? It wasn't enough to disrupt the ballast, but I bet if I held it a foot above the surface, I bet that you would see splotches in this ballast. And right now, we're not seeing any splotches. We're just seeing the ballast glue, or the Elmer's glue, just go right on here. And I'm, I'm not going to live stream the application of all this glue. I hear a noise upstairs. Did you hear that? That means my wife came home from her morning walk and it's time to have lunch soon.
So if you want to see what this looks like after it dries, all you have to do is move your eyes slightly to the left and you can see what it looks like after it dries because I did this exact same thing on the first patch. I just wasn't live streaming. I'm live streaming this off my iPhone and um, the only trouble with that, and I have earbuds in, in my ears, which are picking up my microphone. They're picking up my voice and transmitting it by Bluetooth to my cell phone. But the trouble with that is if we were to run a train, you wouldn't hear the sound of the train very well. So I'm going to figure out a good way to connect a regular microphone to my iPhone or to use some kind of a streaming tool. Now there's a bubble, but I think the bubble is probably going to burst soon. Now another question you might ask is, what's the right amount of glue? And I've heard people say, put whatever you think the right amount of glue is on and then put more. It's a little bit like how, how many staging tracks do you need? And the answer is figure out how many staging tracks you need and then double it. Um, and boy, is that true. I'm about to add another three staging tracks to my layout and I thought I was going crazy. Okay, so it looks like I got, I call that enough glue. It's uh, starting to take some time to absorb. So now we can just go back to putting the wetting solution on. Now, like I said, if, if I just sprayed alcohol over the top of this, like I was doing last week, it, it, it would only take a minute, but it would also disrupt a bunch of these grains. So I don't really want to do that. I don't want to bore you with this tedious process either, but at least you know that some good things in model railroading take time. And, and there's no way of getting around that. That's just a fact. People come down in this basement and they say, oh my God, how did you build this? And I always say, well, if you do the same thing for 35 years in a row, you can get quite a lot done. The problem is to not change what you're doing. And of course, and 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 also to do, be doing something that you find interesting. In my case, I was modeling the Burlington Northern from Tukwila in South Seattle to Bellingham, which is about 100 miles north of Seattle. And there, it is so interesting all the different things that went on between, you know, Argo Yard and and Stacy Street Yard, Interbay Yard. It just, the fun never stops. You know, there's two yards in Everett. And um, and then there's Sky Comish up in the Mountain Pass. And then there's the Burlington Yard. If you're ever in this area, the Seattle area, make a special effort to visit the Skagit Valley and Mount Vernon and Burlington. Burlington is just north of Mount Vernon, which is called the tulip capital of the world because there's a lot of tulips growing here. But the yard and the, the prototype yard in Burlington, and of course you, you all know the Burlington Northern was named after a town in Illinois, not, not uh, Burlington, Washington. But, and of course that was served by the, the, the CB and Q. Um, if you're ever here, one of the best rail fanning things is to go to the Burlington Yard, and mainly because it's a five track yard off the main line, and the main line goes up to uh, Vancouver. And the trouble is there's not that many trains to Vancouver per day, but this yard, if you're a, a yard fan, is the perfect yard to model on a model railroad. It's got five tracks and it has a branch going in each direction, or it did, at least the, in the era that I model it did. 
And so the one branch went up into the mountains called the Concrete Branch, and the other branch went to Anacortes, which is a port town where the ferry goes to the San Juan Islands, which is another place to visit if you're ever here. And so these two branch lines came together in the Burlington Yard, and um, the railroading is just for for the for especially for a model railroading is just perfect because you have you have to f sort out the cars which ones go east which ones go west which ones go north and which ones go south. Now one of my friends who worked for the railroad told me that the the cars that went north from Burlington they actually took them south to Everett to be classified and then they would put them in a local train. I mean, they would put them in the uh, international train that would go up to Vancouver and went that far north. Or I guess there was a there was a um, there was a local train that that went from Everett up to Bellingham. So if you were if you were in Burlington and you had a car for Bellingham, it would generally be sent at least two times farther than necessary. Because they would send it south to Everett and then put it on a local train to get switched to go north to Bellingham and get switched up there. Now, if you don't get enough glue, what will happen here is that when you come down 10 hours later or whatever, you'll see some light patches where the ballast has dried out and it wasn't glued. And you can see right away, you need to go back and put more glue in. But usually you can do it without any particular fuss because once the ballast is down there, it's, it's pretty good. Well, should we call it a day? You can see I've got more gluing to do, but the, it's not going to be any different than what you've already seen. Yeah. And maybe in the next time we'll we'll um, figure out a, uh, how to do this asphalt pavement. Well, there it is. We've got a little bit of this glued down. We've got a lot of it uh, set up for the, um, you know, it's at its level, pavement. It'll just take me a while to get more glue on there. But like I told you, it is really worth spending the extra time because otherwise you get a really irregular surface like this, which you then have to come and maintain. You see how irregular that surface is? I don't know if you can see it, but it's not nearly as good. Now, you know, you could say if we're in a hurry, who cares? But this is a... I'll back up a little bit and you can see this is a center piece on a large yard. And I don't want that to look bad. I want it to look excellent. So that's why we're doing this. One of the things we're going to do next, I'll just show you that is this is another area that needs to be all paved over um, between the rails. This is the uh, uh, Pier 9091 and auto-loading area uh, in between Queen Anne and Magnolia. And uh, you can see some frozen fish in a reefer right there and some cars waiting for the car, uh, the auto racks. But anyway, we're going to take some of this, some of this uh, two millimeter craft foam and cut it so that it'll fit in between the ties. And then once we have craft foam between the ties, we can put this thinner um, one millimeter craft foam I have down here. Did I ever say welcome to the Burlington Northern? Anyway, here's, here's this one millimeter craft foam, which is really thin. And uh, we put that in between the rails when it's code 70, which this is. But for code 83, we're going to try using this two millimeter thick stuff um, 
and uh, uh, I think it'll clear the, the 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 rails enough that we won't have operational problems with it, and it'll probably look closer to the rail height, which will be good. All right, well that's that's going to be all for now. I'll uh, I'll see you all again in a future live stream, and meanwhile, I hope you enjoy having lots of fun with trains. <laughs>